Hello and welcome to Arcade 85. Tomorrow I'll begin chemotherapy for cancer. I've been diagnosed with lymphoma, more specifically diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We'll be talking about that. We're also going to be talking about this crazy chemotherapy that I'm up for tomorrow. The first round begins tomorrow morning. So a little bit of history. I'm a doctor and I have treated patients uh, I'm a dermatologist and I've treated patients for their skin disorders for decades and I don't have much experience with a systemic lymphoma. But all of us with a cancer diagnosis have to learn and we have to figure out uh, what our uh, approach will be and how we feel about this and, uh, and learn as much as we can. So here goes. About two months ago, I remember distinctly when I first noticed this lesion in my neck. About two months ago, I was sitting in my wife's expedition. I was driving and I was parked outside in front of the house waiting for her to come out. We were about to go out for dinner, my wife and I. And the positioning of the car seat and the positioning of the armrest were such that for the first time I could feel a subtle bump under my skin in my neck, I could feel a subtle little bump, but it didn't quite feel right. It didn't feel like those other normal lymph nodes that we have. If you remember when you're sick and I'm coughing with a sore throat <coughs> and I'm sick and I have sore, swollen nodes, ouch, 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 ouch. Those are the same lymph nodes, but in this case, they're just swollen temporarily because they're helping to take care of an infection. In this case, this was not a tender lesion. It was a small, subtle, firm bump that just didn't feel right. And that's really important, that idea that it just didn't feel right. It had the feeling of, hmm, I need to do something about this. And so we went out to dinner that night, and I realized that later in the day, huh, it's actually, or later in the evening, I realized, huh, it's actually kind of hard to find. You have to be in just the right position. Oh, there it is, and I could find it. And so I observed this for the next couple of weeks, didn't want to freak out too fast, but a couple of weeks into it, it became obvious this is not going away. It doesn't seem to change with my eating pattern. It doesn't seem to be a salivary style um, uh, nodule. And so I called up my ENT friend and she ordered a CAT scan, a CT scan. And sure enough, the CT scan showed a 2.3 centimeter lesion that was either a cancer or an unusual lymph node. I had that biopsied and sure enough, it was cancer. I later had it removed with this same ear, nose and throat, head and neck surgeon friend of mine. And here's our diagnosis, here's our pathology report. And as you can see here, we've got a diffuse large cell B lymphoma or a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. There, if you wanna get more information. And so this is cancer, not good news. This isn't the report that you want. This is a cancer. And so the node has been removed. The lymph node has been removed. I then went through a series of diagnostic workup to figure out where else does this lymphoma cancer travel to in my case. In other words, it'll start in a lymph node and then it'll try to take off from there and basically consume the body. The cell, the cancer cell, remember we're made of cells, tissue comprised of cells, cells divide, and the cancer cell, in this case that's taking over, is a lymphocyte, a B lymphocyte cell. That's one of our white blood cells. And so uh, if you remember, white blood cells fight infection. One of those white blood cells is called a B lymphocyte. And sure enough, a B lymphocyte in this case has a genetic mutation that's causing it to divide too rapidly. And so it wants to spread from lymph node to lymph node and from there into other tissue and from there causing you know, widespread diffuse death. And so the workup included a spinal tap and blood work and a PET scan. PET, P-E-T stands for positron emission tomography which is uh, where you get injected into your vein a radio isotope, a radio tracer, and then you emit radiation. And this one's kind of funny because if you get put into a CAT scan or if you get put into an MRI machine, this is you and you're being put into the tube, 
when you're being put into those tubes, you look and these loud machines are going and you're saying, boy, I hope this isn't harming me too much. Meanwhile, when you get your PET scan and you have the radio tracer injected into your vein, you're then placed into a tube and your instinct is to say, I hope this tube doesn't harm me. Then you realize, of course, that whoops, I'm already radioactive. I'm emitting radiation and the tube here is simply receiving it, just detecting it. So in that case, the tube isn't the aggressor. You're the aggressor to the tube, if that makes sense. The great news here is that my scans were negative, meaning we didn't have any cancer anywhere else that we can find. Hence, I've been assigned a stage one cancer diagnosis, which is the earliest one to have, and that's the one that we want. Uh, means it hasn't had a chance to spread around that we can find yet. And remember, anytime we talk about staging and cancer, that's only a question of what the doctors are able to successfully detect. And so we've only successfully detected cancer in the neck and the node in which the cancer was found has been removed. And so I'm kind of that sweet spot right now where, hey, the only cancer that we know about is out of me. Meanwhile, I need to go through chemotherapy because presumably plenty of cells, plenty of those bad lymphocyte cells are trying to start the thing up in other quadrants. And so we're undergoing chemotherapy. The standard in the year 2020 for the cancer that I have, the standard is called R-CHOP, R-CHOP. And watch out anytime doctors are trying to treat you with multiple medicines at the same time, that means not a single, not, there is no single medicine that will work for this condition. Anytime doctors are recommending multiple treatments. In this case, this is a chemotherapy regimen that we call R-CHOP. The rituximab, the one here on top, the rituximab is, uh, is the latest addition to one that historically has been called CHOP. And so I'm getting CHOP and rituximab in more recent decades. And we'll talk about each of these. And so the nature of chemotherapy is let's give the host a chemical that will kill the cancer, but won't kill the host. So the central theme is let's not kill the person that we're treating. And so we start with CHOP. We start with cyclophosphamide. And we're going to make the rest of this video kind of a tribute to modern medicine, Western medicine. And you'll have to forgive me, it's really hot in the arcade this morning, so we're going to towel off here. And so, the regimen of CHOP, C-H-O-P, has been around for a while. Cyclophosphamide is a mustard gas derivative. And so the history with mustard gas is uh, 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 invented or designed in the 1800s and in World War I was used against your enemies that you would spray a nasty, nasty mustard smelling gas. And when you'd prepare this, it's a, uh, uh, it's carbon chain flanked with uh, chloride uh, uh, moieties and, um, and uh, will either have mus um, nitrogen or sulfur in the case of, uh, of the World War I uh, medicines or toxins. And so um, mustard gas was sprayed on your enemy and the enemy would then be burned. In other words, uh, blisters would show up and uh, the orifices were burned and the respiratory tract was burned. It was mustard gas. It was a uh, chemical uh, warfare and it was absolutely awful. And you say, well, what does that have to do with what we're up to? Well, it was later discovered that when you're exposed to this terrible mustard gas, that your white blood cell count goes down dramatically. And so medical science says, hey, if it drives down the white blood cell count, maybe this can be used as something that might kill cancer and not necessarily kill the host. And so the cyclophosphamide is quite literally a derivative of mustard gas. We'll go ahead and draw that here. And we're drawing a little mustard gas sign. Uh, watch out. Cyclophosphamide is a mustard gas derivative. Can you see that there? All right, next on the list, we've got doxorubicin. So doxorubicin 
is, a, uh, is created by a Streptomyces actinobacteria. And if you remember, uh, back in the 1920s, um, it was discovered that bacteria, I'm sorry, it was discovered that microorganisms, and in this case, fungi, will release chemicals that will kill other microorganisms. If you're a microorganism, if you're a bacterium or a fungal species, you're trying your hardest to compete and you're literally releasing chemicals that help you get rid of your opponents. And um, Alexander Fleming discovers in 1929, hey, wait a minute, um, this penicillium fungus is releasing a chemical that's killing the resident bacteria so that the fungus can grow better amid other microorganisms. And that was the birth of penicillin, and that gave rise to the modern era of antibiotic therapy. And so in the 20th century, we spent a lot of time working on trying to figure out which microorganisms produce which toxic substances that will kill other microorganisms. And in this case, the doxorubicin is created by a streptomyces species of, uh, of actinobacteria. And sure enough, it has toxicity there. And in my case, it has toxicity against my malignant B cell uh, lymphocytes. And so we're really excited because in this case, microorganisms are going to be helping the process. And we'll go ahead and draw... We've got some gram-positive microorganisms there helping us out producing doxorubicin, a streptomyces species. Uh, the third medicine here, we call it vincristine. It had a brand at one time uh, commonly known as Oncovin. If you notice, they like to use different names so that they can make their acronym sound really clever. And so uh, vincristine, in this case, is a plant derivative and... Uh, it, it's, a, it's a little flowering plant. It's a Madagascar periwinkle. And so you've got flowers in your garden, and one of them is a Madagascar periwinkle. And rumor has it that for hundreds of years, if you do things with the, if you can get extract out of this periwinkle plant, then it will help you in certain ways. And sure enough, science starts to research this. Hey, plants produce a lot of really cool chemicals that other organisms can use. And lo and behold, uh, today we have vincristine coming from that flower plant. And so um, in this case, we've got a plant that's helping us out. So we'll draw a flower here. All right, so vincristine coming from a plant. The last one on the list here is prednisone. Prednisone is a hormone that you are releasing every day. All of us are, all mammal species, heck, probably all vertebrates are releasing a little bit of cortisol every day from their adrenal glands. And so you've got glands that sit on top of your kidneys that every morning and throughout the day, they excrete just a little bit of this medicine, cortisol, which we uh, have modified a little bit and we call it prednisone. It's a, an anti-inflammatory medicine. It's quite possibly one that you've been on before because it's very common. And so an anti-inflammatory medicine, and in this case, a whopping high dose, and this one's given orally, unlike the others that are given by vein. Uh, a whopping high dose of an anti-inflammatory prednisone uh, helps the process along because uh, the anti-inflammatory nature of this hormone is it helps to calm down the reactions of the white blood cells. And so that's the CHOP. So the original CHOP minus the uh, rituximab, the original CHOP, a series of chemicals. Oh, let's draw this. So we got the adrenal glands. We've got a pair of kidneys with little glands on top. And so we've got a pair of kidneys with little glands on top. Hence, so far, helping us out with this cancer, we've got a mustard gas, we've got a streptomyces extract, we have a flower extract, Madagascar periwinkle, and we have a cortisol from human adrenal glands. All right, so that brings us to our rituximab. So for a while, patients uh, with this type of lymphoma, they were treated with CHOP, and now they're treated with R-CHOP. R is for rituximab. And the fun thing here is in the nomenclature, if you see an AB at the end of a medicine, that'll stand for antibody. And sure enough, 
the B cell, human B cells, will uh, exhibit an antigen on the surface of the cell, and that's called a CD20. There are a whole host of antigens. This very one in particular is called CD20, and it is unique to B cells. Hence, in this case, modern medical science has said, hmm, we have a lot of medical conditions that involve B cells. Wouldn't it be cool if we created an antibody, a little protein that would help the body to destroy a B cell if need be? And so sure enough, the, uh, the medicine rituximab is a very specific anti-CD20 antibody that's going to be given. Hence, I'm going to re be receiving it as I do these others in the veins. And in this case, an antibody, a protein, little tiny protein, is going to be finding individual CD20 antigens on individual B cells and helping the body to wipe them out that way. And so we'll go ahead and do the international drawing for the international drawing for antibodies. All right, and so in this case, we've got modern medical science has figured out that anti-CD20 antibodies, mustard gas, streptomyces extract, Madagascar periwinkle extract, and adrenal gland cortisol is the best remedy for me. Whoa, that's intimidating. And so we start our first round tomorrow. Wish me luck. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to all of my family and friends, everyone that's been helping me through this. Uh, obviously, you get diagnosed with, uh, with lymphoma, and it's going to be difficult. And I've received so much love from family, friends, my patients in my dermatology practice, my office staff, my ward family, the doctors that have been treating me. I, I'm running into doctors that I haven't seen for years. I'm uh, getting uh, reacquainted. I'm getting to play the role of the humble patient as opposed to the doctor who knows what's up. I'm now the patient who simply receives uh, the recommendations and the treatments from other doctors. And so uh, this is my comeuppance. Um, I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm grateful for all the blessings that I've received from him. I'm grateful to have a heavenly father that listens and answers to our prayers or and answers our prayers. And if anyone asks, hey, what can I do for you? I've had so many people, so, I love you guys. I've had so many people offer me, what can I do? And I answer the same each time, pray for me. Even if you don't believe in deity, pray for me. That would be awesome. I could use those blessings. Have fun with your video games. Take care and we'll see you next time.